Hello class, Professor Mandeville back. This uh, lecture is for History 102. And uh, last lecture I recorded, we talked about the rise of cities. And one of the reasons why cities uh, increased in population and size so dramatically during the Gilded Age uh, was immigration. And we were hitting around at that towards the end of that lecture, and especially when we were talking about social problems and living conditions, uh, that the immigrants, but all people who lived in the cities, for that matter, had to face during this time period. And there's a famous colorized photograph in your textbook on page 683 of Mulberry Street, down on uh, New York's Lower East Side, which is uh, in the middle of Little Italy, and you can see how crowded the street is and uh, the prevalence of horse-drawn vehicles. Uh, and uh, also those buildings pictured there on each side of the street are your typical dumbbell tenement buildings that we talked about last class. So, we want to focus in on uh, the tremendous amount of immigration that took place during this time period. And so we'll start out by just uh, examining some statistics. In the 1850s, 1860s, and 1870s, about 2 million immigrants entered the United States every 10, year or 10 years or decade as it's known. So things were pretty steady in that 30 year time period. Then things changed dramatically in the 1880s. Uh, during the 1880s, somewhere between five and six million immigrants came into America in that decade. So the number really for all intents and purposes tripled from its 30-year, 10-year average. And, uh, you know, by 1882, there were about more, slightly more than 2,000 immigrants entering the United States daily. So immigration really picked up in that time period and uh, continued at that rate in the 1890s and at the turn of the century. Now, uh, one thing that also went hand in hand, especially with the 1880s uh, and forward, the major source of immigrants coming to the United States shifted. And that shift was from uh, traditional uh, Anglo-Europe, meaning uh, the British Isles uh, and uh places like France, Netherlands, and whatnot, to Southern and Eastern Europe. So the shift uh, from uh, the people who were mainly coming from the British Isles, uh, immigrants were coming from places such as Italy, Greece, Hungary, Poland, Russia, and uh, with this shift in immigration, uh, also led to uh, you know, immigrants, I suppose, being more identifiable and distinct. Because one thing that changed dramatically right off the bat, the majority of these new immigrants, as they were known, could not speak English. So that made them, their identity uh, quite easy, easily identified. And also, uh, there was a shift in their religious background, which back in this day and age made a tremendous amount of difference to some Americans anyway. <clears throat> we had a shift away from mainly Protestant immigrants coming to America to a large number of Catholics, especially coming from Italy, and also uh, Christian uh, Orthodox groups, 
Jews and others, which also caused some uh, problems because it led to a tremendous amount of prejudice that we'll talk about later on today uh, towards these new immigrant groups, as they were known, because of their language barriers and because of the fact that they had uh, what to many Americans were unpopular religious backgrounds. So, uh, back to our statistical analysis here. Uh, the 1900 census reported some pretty amazing statistics when it came down to the concentration of immigrants in our largest cities. <clears throat> and one of the questions asked on this particular census was, if you were born in another country besides the United States, or were your parents, either one or both of them, born in another country? So in other words, were you an immigrant or were you a first generation American? <clears throat> now, the statistics showed that in 1900, 50% of the population of Philadelphia were either born in another country or their parents were, at least one of them. The percentage present in Boston was 60% of the population fell into those two categories. But the most astounding were the cities of Chicago and New York. 80% of the residents in those two cities were either born in another country or their parents were. <clears throat> and with New York being our largest city by the turn of the century, a population nearly 3 million people, uh, there were also some uh, uh, you know, startling statistics to re uh, relate to America. <clears throat> because of this concentration of immigrants and these new immigrants coming over the last 20 years from 1800 forward, or eight, excuse me, 1880, uh, there were more Italians living in New York City than in Naples, Italy. And there were more Germans residing in New York City than in, <clears throat> excuse me, Hamburg, Germany. And because of past immigration and continuing immigration, there were twice as many people of Irish descent that fell into those uh, census categories as there were in the city of Dublin, Ireland. So our cities were teeming with immigrants. Now, <clears throat> one place that became the center for immigration uh, in New York City and on the East Coast was Ellis Island. Now, Maybe some of you have been there before. If you ever uh, took the, uh, you know, the boat tour uh, of the statue, you know, to get out to the island that Statue of Liberty's on, one of the stops on that tour is Ellis Island. I know that's how I ended up going there. And uh, I basically spent the entire day at Ellis Island. It was our first stop. It was so interesting. Uh, I just rode by the Statue of Liberty. I didn't bother to get off there. <clears throat> so, uh, Ellis Island was, is an amazing place. And if you are down in the city, certainly try to make time to go and visit Ellis Island. It will not disappoint. And I'll include uh, links in this uh, module to uh, the National Park Service website for Ellis Island. You can explore that on your own. And uh, I wish I would have explored it before I toured it. But, uh, you know, you do it, you know, ha what happens, happens. <clears throat> so, uh, Ellis Island, a lot of things I learned there on my, the day I spent there just amazed me. The number of immigrants that uh, were processed there. And then just some basic premises that I was not familiar with. Now, 
immigrants would obviously come over here by ship from Europe. And during the 1880s, 1890s, so many are coming that the ships waiting to uh, have their <clears throat> passengers disembark on Ellis Island uh, to be processed at the Im giant immigration center there would start lining up. And sometimes you'd have to be anchored off the shore of Ellis Island for several days just awaiting your turn for your ship to pull in to the docks and on low. <clears throat> but one thing I wasn't aware of was that uh, on a passenger ship filled with immigrants coming to the United States, that ship would make a stop before it stopped at Ellis Island. It stopped in lower Manhattan. There was a immig small immigration processing center near Battery Park down in uh, lower Manhattan. And <clears throat> all the passengers who were riding first class on that passenger vessel and were immigrants were allowed to uh, leave the ship there, be processed very quickly in a much smaller processing center that was much nicer because they had the ability to afford first class tickets, which most of your immigrants coming to the United States during this time period <clears throat> could not afford first class passage. Some of them were lucky to be able to afford uh, a ticket down in steerage, which, which was down with the cargo and the luggage and so forth. So after the first class passengers uh, were dropped off in lower Manhattan, then the ship would ultimately make it to Ellis Island. Then everybody would be unloaded and the processing would begin. And when you visit Ellis Island, uh, you'll notice that there are several floors to the processing center and immigrants were uh, ferried around inside going floor to floor to floor to have different parts of the process take place. <clears throat> and there were these giant staircases that they'd all have to climb. And these were put there on purpose because there were immigration officials posted on these staircases. And if they saw somebody struggling to climb the stairs uh, to these various levels, they had markers in their hands and they'd put a black mark on your arm, which was an indication for when you had your medical exam <clears throat> for the doctors to take a close look at you because you might be ill. And one reason why you could be denied entry into <clears throat> the United States as an immigrant was if you had a certain contagious disease. And if the doctors determined that during your physical examination, you'd be denied entry into the United States you'd be sent to one of the several infirmaries on Ellis Island till you could recover enough to hop back on a ship and return where you came from. So they were always keeping an eye out for people that might be indicating that they were ill. <clears throat> now, another part of the process would be the interview process where uh, immigration officials would ask you a whole series of questions, starting out with, what's your name? And remember, we got language barriers here. So <clears throat> those of you that are into genealogy, uh, I've heard, because I'm not myself, but I've heard sometimes you have a difficult time finding uh, your lost relatives because you're under the impression that their last name was spelled a certain way or was a certain, you know, word. But when they got to Ellis Island, that could change dramatically because the immigration official is going to write down what they think you said. And if they really couldn't understand you after repeated attempts, they'd write down whatever they wanted to in some cases, depending on what mood they were in. So sometimes you have a hard time finding uh, your, uh, you know, who you're descended from because 
it got goofed up at Ellis Island. Then they'd ask you a whole series of other questions, which could result in you being rejected. Because if <clears throat> somehow they determined that you were insane, which I'm not quite how they sure they determined that in the 1880s or 1890s, psychology was a fledgling discipline, uh, you could be denied entry to the United States. Uh, if they determined that you were a polygamist, which obviously you'd have to admit yourself, you know, when you're filling out the application, you'd have to say, yes, uh, this is my wife, and here's my second wife and my third wife. You know, obviously you'd have to be foolish enough to admit it to the officials. But maybe the word didn't spread on the ship you were on, and you're being honest, and it's going to cost you entry. Because polygamy was illegal by then in the United States. If the immigration officials somehow determined that you were a prostitute, uh, you were not allowed in the country. Now, how they were going to do that, I'm not sure. Uh, unless uh, somebody was foolish enough to proposition the immigration official, then I suppose you should be denied access if you're that foolish. Uh, if they determined that you were an alcoholic, I guess if you showed up to Ellis Island stumbling off the ship, half in the bag, you're going to be stumbling back on and going back where you came from because you weren't allowed in the country. <clears throat> and uh, if they somehow determined that you were an anarchist, which is also a pretty vague thing to determine, I suppose if you're sitting in line reading uh, Karl Marx's manifesto, it might raise suspicions. But other than that, I'm not quite sure how they determined that. But if they did, you could be denied access. And finally, as I mentioned before, there were a whole host of contagious diseases that if the doctors during the medical examination determined you had, you weren't getting in. And that especially could lead to some very difficult decisions for families. Let's say a whole family came over from Italy and they determined that someone in your family is ill. You might have been perfectly healthy when you hopped on board that ship, but because you're, you know, cramped in cramped quarters, you couldn't afford a very good ticket, you might have become ill on the ride over, catching it from somebody else. But think about it. What if uh, they told you your wife is ill, she's not getting in, so uh, you, you are admitted, but your wife's going back. What are you going to do? Even if your wife begs you, go, go, get a job, I'll make it there someday. That's an awful hard decision. Vice versa for a wife, a husband. What if it was one of your children? I know myself, I would have said thanks, but no thanks. I'll go back with my children uh, because the bonds, obviously, that parents have with their children. If you have children, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you don't and you do someday, you'll obviously know what I'm referring to. So <clears throat> some heartbreaking stories could happen because of part of a family unit being denied access for various reasons, but mainly disease. So once you did make it through the process at Ellis Island, and you step foot in New Jersey, basically, <clears throat> where most of them did, uh, then you're going to try to find your way to employment, typically, as soon as you possibly can, or try to find other family members who had preceded you in immigration. And right at the, uh, you know, where people would land from Ellis Island, there were recruiters right there offering people jobs on the spot in factories in various cities. They'd have chartered trains maybe to Pittsburgh or Chicago where they needed workers in certain factories. They'd say, you want to start a job tomorrow? Hop on that train right over there. We'll give you a free ride to where you're going to be working. Now, in New York City... In other cities, immigrants, because of uh, some of the things that I talked about previously in this lecture, language barriers, 
prejudice of Americans towards these non-English speaking Catholic, Jewish, Orthodox immigrants tended to settle in their own ethnic neighborhoods. <clears throat> and they did this for a variety of reasons. One of the most famous in New York City, obviously, was Little Italy. Now, <clears throat> an Italian would be immediately drawn to Little Italy because if they didn't speak a word of English, they could be guaranteed once they got to Little Italy, somebody spoke Italian so they could communicate. They also could find the comforts of their home country. There would be shops that sold Italian items. You know, some of the items printed in Italian even. They could buy newspapers printed in Italian. They could go to a Catholic mass delivered in Latin and Italian. So they, and they also went there for protection because immigrants were the victims of violence and prejudice. And when you're an Italian in Little Italy, you're safe. And <clears throat> the same thing, <coughs> excuse me, I got to drink water, went for other immigrant groups. That's why most large cities still to this day have neighborhoods known as Chinatown. Same sort of thing. Uh, where, you know, I grew up north of Detroit. Uh, for whatever reason, a large number of Greeks and Polish people were drawn to the city of Detroit. And still to this day, there's a thriving area of Detroit known as Greek Town, home to numerous Greek restaurants, pastry shops, grocery stores, all a Greek culture right there in these neighborhoods of Detroit. And it's, you know, today it's quite a tourist attraction because people go there and uh, have a fine Greek dinner and uh, celebrate different occasions and whatnot. And there was a thriving pole town in uh, Detroit, as it was known. But unfortunately, General Motors bought up the entire area and built a giant factory there, which... Uh, presently, only a small part of it operates anymore as GM moved most of their operations uh, out of Michigan and out of the United States. But there still is one Polish, uh, you know, suburb that's very near, you know, borders the city of Detroit. That's Hamtramck, which is filled with uh, still, a lot of Polish people and Polish stores and restaurants and things like that. Not to the extent of Greek Town or Little Italy in New York, if you've ever been there, uh, but sort of a smaller version. And every big city had their own little ethnic enclaves where these people uh, sought comfort and safety, especially when they first arrived here. Now, this trend in immigration will continue, and in your book, if you look on page 687, table 18.2 shows you immigrants and their children as percentage of population as reported by the 1920 census. <clears throat> I told you what it was like with select cities for the 1900 census 20 years earlier, and you can see <clears throat> that the numbers in New York City only dropped a little bit to 76%. Uh, same with Chicago. But then you can see some other cities that were on the rise. Boston was. Uh, uh, the city of Detroit was 65%. Uh, and even out west with San Francisco and Seattle and Los Angeles. So uh, that trend continued on through the first couple decades of the 1920s. Or excuse me, of the 1900s. Two things really brought immigration to a screeching halt uh, by 1920, though. One was World War I. World War I really curtailed immigration, especially from Europe, because, quite frankly, it was too dangerous to travel here. German U-boats were sinking passenger ships like the Lusitania that we'll talk about later on. And in the 1920s, there was a backlash to immigration uh, and 
the Harding administration and a Republican-controlled Congress passed numerous immigration restriction laws with specific quotas on certain countries and the number of citizens that they could allow into the country. So there was, uh, you know, a big downturn in immigration in the 20s. And then, uh, obviously, the late 20s and through the mid-30s, people weren't immigrating anywhere because there was a worldwide depression. So there was really no country that was the land of opportunity during the horrible Great Depression that struck the world in the late 20s through the mid 30s. So <clears throat> that's it for immigration today. Uh, if you ever get a chance, go to Ellis Island, at least visit the website that I'm gonna provide you with a link to. And uh, that's all I have for you today. I'm losing my voice for some reason, must be allergies. Uh, everybody take care and I'll be talking to you soon. Bye now.